Thank you very much, Suzanne. Uh, I wish I could be in person and I was going to complain how video doesn't cut it, but it looks like I can't even see you or you can't even see me. Uh, we are hopeful. I'm hopeful that we will make up for it in a maybe future event, but thank you so much for joining me. I'm delighted to be here. Uh, as one girl in engineering, uh, definitely we need more. And I want to share my experience and in the context, hopefully inspire you, whether you are a girl or a boy, to follow this path of engineering, which will open many new worlds for you as it did for me. So thank you for being here today and thank you for your patience with me. So Suzanne, I'm scrolling down. Hopefully people can see my screen. Yeah, we can. We can see okay. it. Yes. All yes. right, perfect. So I want to start with my story. Uh, without giving away my age, uh, it goes back to a while back where there was no internet and absolutely no cell phones and the red phone you see was actually the same color of phone I had in my family's house as I was about your age. It was connected to a wall in the middle of the living room where anytime a friend called I would have to speak in the presence of my mother, father, mother, grandma and etc. So this is the story of one girl who grew up and this was not many years ago by the way uh, that how um, things have changed uh, by now with technology imagine a world where you grow up with no social media absolutely no texting or even snapchat so this is where it all began so I think I was both of the worlds. I was a typical girl or perhaps I was a completely atypical girl. Uh, so I love to play with my dolls, play with my mom's makeup, do ballet, play hopscotch. Really wanted to be pretty much a mom when I grew up, like many women I saw in the TV shows. I also liked to solve riddles and puzzles. I often pondered how and why. I wanted to run fast and faster than boys, and I liked jumping high and higher than boys. I enjoyed writing stories. One great thing that had me going, perhaps the only thing that might make me a typical girl, is that I had male figures in my life who really had no gender specific expectations from me. So I wanna tell you about mentors and how they can make a difference. When I was a little girl in elementary school and middle school, I was shy. I didn't have the confidence and the scale was tilted for me towards the can I of self-doubt. I even didn't think I was as smart as it would take until some unexpected mentors started showing up in my life. Those were people actually, they did not necessarily realize they were being mentors to me. And some of them were actually based on even the briefest conversations one could have. But those made such a big difference to tilt the scale for me to I can. So those conversations, I, as far as I remember, the first one goes to fifth grade for me. And it was during an extracurricular activity. I don't remember the details, but I remember my feelings and I'll share with you. We were um, asked to come up with a solution. It's one of these games where a few gadgets are given to you and you are supposed to use those to provide a solution. I don't remember the details, but with the self-doubt that I have, uh, I had a solution, but I was not sure whether I should pitch for it or not. And our, uh, I guess, uh, uh, camp lead came and I, with a very soft voice, told her, should I do my suggestion? And he looked at me and frowned and said, do you think it's a good way? And then I immediately gave up on it till I, at the end of the competition, I saw them giggling and laughing and saying, this is your lesson. What you had was actually the right idea, but you should have been confident enough to go for it. I can tell you, I never forgot that experience and on the spot how much I hated him at that point, but he really made a difference. And from that point on, I really stopped doubting myself that much. So that was my first eye-opening experience with a mentor that really wasn't trying to be. Uh, 
a few other conversations happened in my life when I was in eighth grade with a literature teacher telling me that actually I am quite creative. That was very nice to hear and that eliminated definitely one of the other obstacles that I didn't think I had the smarts. And then another brief conversation at 11th grade with a high school principal, literally a few minutes, him asking, do you think you can be the valedictorian in the college? Your grades seem to be so high. And at that point, I really, till that point, had no idea actually I was getting good grades. So these little experiences, and if you sum those interactions up, they weren't really more than, I would say, 15 minutes, the total three of them. That literally made me have a different perspective in how I look at things. Now, I was shy, remains to stay, but this, I defy it by volunteering to do any talks I can by showing up and just being there. I think that's something one can definitely work with. Being shy is definitely not an obstacle. So I just want to share you my journey of I can's and these question marks weren't there in my original presentation. So it just ends with an exclamation point. So my journey starts way, way east on the other side of the Atlantic Ocean in Istanbul, Turkey, where I had my K-12 education and college education in engineering. And after a number of ICANN moments, I flew all the way from Istanbul to Washington, D.C. and got my master's and PhD and got my first, second, third jobs in Washington, D.C. area. ICANN was working well for me. Uh, and finally, the, my last half is uh, in Knoxville, Tennessee, where I moved a year ago to the best job ever that I'll be telling you more about. So what do I do as an engineer? Perhaps the Scrabble here actually will wake you up and pay more attention to what I'm saying here. Uh, so engineers actually wear many, many hats. And it really is, in the end, all about where your passion resides. I do spend a lot of time thinking. I do have moments of innovation and creativity, which really keep me going. I have design projects that I have to have a pen and paper, or nowadays, perhaps, a computer. There's a lot of opportunities for me to be a leader. I'm, I manage many, many dollars. In industry, actually 10 million was uh, where I left. So if you think engineers don't understand money or don't need to deal with it, definitely think again. It has to be an educator. It helps me actually to have the credibility to be an advocate of the issues that really matter to me and I'll talk more about them. I do spend a good amount of time writing I do have time to test the ideas. I spend time measuring things. I spend time in front of the computer programming or trying to fix a crash that happens in the moments before a major talk I wanted to give. Uh, I can work alone. I can also work in a team. I work in a lab. I work from home and I can work on a computer. Real engineering is what you make it to be. So I just wanted to tell you what I do in University of Tennessee. I started here about a year ago and I'm responsible for all student and academic affairs in our engineering college. Um, since it is my passion to engage with students, I a volunteer at opportunities to give talks. And typically I try to combine my passions. So here I am on the right hand side talking about climate change to our honor students in the university. And I'll tell you more about it. So here in UT, I'm a, an academic administrator with a volunteer spirit. Here are some other things I've been doing in Knoxville. It is important for me that engineering education is accessible to everyone. I was one girl that supposedly beat the odds to make it here, and I want to make sure others uh, will have the same story, similar stories that end with success. So on the left-hand side, it's one of our Tennessee uh, uh, LSAMP, uh, Lewis Talk uh, Minority Program uh, events where a number of female students were awarded for their participation. 
And I, uh, despite being an academic administrator, I'm also heavily engaged with my research projects. And you see me in my lab with my students discussing how we could mount things on drones that could fly around and measure things for us. Before coming to UT, I was also an administrator in another university in Washington, DC. My passion, one of my passions is actually caring for Earth. When I got my PhD degree, it was about remotely monitoring. That means from places where you don't have to touch the object you are monitoring. So I was remotely monitoring the earth, the vegetation on it, the health of the forest, using a microwave engineering technology where we could send signals that look like ocean waves, but that are not visible and collect them back to understand the health of the vegetation our uh, Earth is covered with. So that was one of the projects I worked and I was funded by NASA to do that. And I never gave up on that passion and you'll see it keeps popping up in my life every time I find an opportunity. So, uh, I did before joining a university as an engineer, I had the option actually to work in many different settings. I was uh, granted the opportunity to serve the government and our military, working both at Army Research Labs as well as Naval Surface Warfare Center. So the technology I'm able to develop with uh, electrical engineering actually can help our military defend itself better. The, the big, long, tall wires you see on the Humvee are actually very helpful when they want to communicate with each other, but a disaster for the enemy because they are standing out and waving, I'm here. So one of the tasks I was uh, working in the army was that how do we make them disappear, still have the same functionality by making them flat and printed on the surfaces of this vehicle rather than sticking out. So that was one of the projects I had fun working in the army. Before joining army, I was working in industry in a company that focused on satellite communications, CompSat Laboratories. It later uh, got acquired by Lockheed Martin, and uh, I continued to work in Lockheed Martin, a major defense organization. So I was responsible there developing antennas. Antennas are these devices that you have actually in your cell phones that are the main ingredient that communicates between other cell phones. They radiate the energy that you create with your voice. And then the other uh, antenna on the receiving end will collect that energy and turn it into your voice again. So these devices can be of many sizes and shapes depending on how far you want to communicate. So if you want to communicate all the way up in the sky, you need rather larger ones. So when I was in Lockheed Martin, I was designing such antennas and also measuring them and understanding how we could make sure they, they deliver the specifics that were required of them. So as I mentioned, uh, uh, engineering is a good platform to pursue your passion, and a degree gives you really the uh, credibility to advocate for your passion. So before joining University of Tennessee in Knoxville, I was in Washington, DC, and I was leading the uh, uh, efforts in the university, uh, Catholic University there for sustainability and care of Earth. That led me to a meeting with the Pope Francis in Vatican. If you are not aware, I would Google him and climate change and see his amazing passion for our care of Earth. But uh, it enabled me an audience with Pope Francis, as well as actually the patriarch of Bartolomeo in Istanbul, who is also an equal advocate uh, with Pope Francis on this climate issues. Uh, in addition, uh, being in DC enabled me to uh, get connected to uh, policymakers, and I ran an organization and hosted an event where James Baker, our former Undersecretary of Commerce, uh, was one of our speakers, and I had an interna international team of climate experts helping me. So that is one of my passion. And I feel great that my degree enables me to push for uh, these uh, topics that are important to me with some credibility. So engineering actually, the degree in engineering opened many doors for me. 
It enabled me to be a teacher, a mentor, a leader, a researcher. It enabled me to serve the military and NASA and industry. Of all, it has enabled me to have fun while getting paid for it. So I'm here today because I told you my personal story and the number of handful interactions I had with mentors, some of whom didn't even realize they were being mentors to me. So engineering truly changed my life. The little child girl from Istanbul to someone who gives talks in, across the globe. Uh, the girl in Istanbul to a PhD in Washington DC. So I'm here today thinking perhaps I can offer that short unexpected conversation to you be that unexpected mentor to you, whether you're a girl or a boy, whether you want to be an engineer or not, you can if you really want to. And that's the message I want to convey to you today. So if anything I learned, one lesson I learned is that everything changes. There's no point dwelling on it and clinging to past. Everything will change. There is nothing permanent except change, to improve is to change. To be perfect is to change often. So let's say be that change is good. Change is what makes us adapt and try. We cannot avoid it in our lives. We must truly embrace it. Actually, if you think about it, change is triggered by someone who is thinking or acting differently than others. Actually, that is a good thing. So please don't be afraid to be different. Pave your own path. I want to talk to you now about some examples of great changes. Of course, personal great changes are very important that enables us to jump to the next level. But being the engineer, I have to give the geeky talk. So here we go. So I started with a big red rotary phone. And I want to show on the right hand side what is it that we are doing today for the same operation? No more big bulky wires. We have just big tall stations that are distributed away from each other and communicating with each other with the kind of antennas I mentioned earlier. And instead of being close to a wall talking in a living room in the middle of all your parents and family, you can now take your cell phone anywhere private on the beach on the trail and you could have the same communication. Now this is the magic of electrical engineers and computer sciences scientists presented to you. So let's look at other major changes humanity experienced. On the left we are looking at actually a compass. It was developed before Christ and it was showing uh, the south direction, uh, the ladle pointed always to the south direction. Now imagine early times and you want to go from point A to point B. What would you do? You were looking at main uh, landmarks, maybe the stars, and uh, you were just hoping pretty much for the best. But nowadays, we are very precise and we know exactly in a millimetric accuracy almost, uh, how we can navigate. And this is thanks to Earth observing satellite systems where antennas look at the Earth. And if you have three of them, actually, this is some geometry for you. This is why math is amazing. If you have three of these satellites, uh, the possibility of your uh, presence is reduced to one number that's right at the intersection of these three circles generated by these three satellites. So you can exactly know the location of an object within meters for commercial purposes, within much uh, lesser uh, units in uh, military operations, you would know where you are. And knowing where you are would mean with the help of a handy computer in your hand like that of your uh, a cell phone, you could navigate easily and go from point A to point B without even knowing what is north, what is south, like I tend to do all the time. Now, this is the collective magic of electrical, mechanical, aerospace engineers, rocket scientists, and computer scientists. What else have human beings witnessed uh, with change? 
our earliest greatest invention was the fire and you can imagine it's many uses energy light and visibility uh, as a weapon or for food uh, we we had multiple uses once fire was invented now perhaps we didn't start the fire but certainly we kept it going where we wanted when we wanted and how we wanted and that was a big deal i'll show you an example of it so we use fire to light our way and the change happened from one candle light to what you see what edison invented later on to the light bulb and we being the restless beings we are and always improving things and changing things that became the kind of led lights we are advocating for today for a clean environment from one candle light to hundreds of uh, powerful lights uh, that lights up our nights every day, every night. So this is the magic of electrical engineers. If you think this conversation is biased towards electrical engineers, you are probably right, by the way. Uh, another one of the most important inventions we had as human beings is actually the wheel and the axle concept. It took perfect carpentry to get it right. Once, once we got it right, before uh, Christ 3500, it spread across the globe like wildfire. And imagine where we started to where we ended up today. From carriage to luxury electric vehicles, from two horsepowers to 500 horsepowers that are energized by electricity. Now, this is the magic of physicists, mechanical engineers, electrical engineers, and the car you see on the right with its navigation system, certainly computer scientists as well. So as human beings, we always liked counting. Actually, it's not even clear to me whether we started talking or counting first. We used to use tally sticks to count things. And then we evolved it to abacus and counted in groups and categories. But it has always been inherent to us. We are naturals as human beings when it comes to math. Math is actually, if you think of it, the universal language. If there were aliens somewhere else, the commonality we would have with them would be the math language. They have to have the same math concepts. So counting, which is more or less, which is taller or shorter, has always been inherent to human nature, and we have been obsessed with it. Uh, so sophisticated counting and computing has always been a decades worth uh, um, focus area for us. Uh, doing math better and faster has always been our objective, and I'm showing here devices we build and in the years to come how it evolved in these pictures you see here on the right and i had to mention this before i moved any further computing is natural to girls don't let anyone tell otherwise uh, the first computer programmer augusta da byron uh, she was the one who suggested to babbage who actually let me quickly scroll up is the developer of the analytical engine you see on the right hand side that that really made the current modern time computers possible as things evolved you see on the left hand side the first electromechanical computer which is much bigger than my home right now and it is significantly less powerful than what you see on the right hand side, which is a laptop which would fit on my palm, which is probably orders of magnitude. That means probably 100 times or 1,000 times faster and better than what you see at the home size electromechanical computer decades ago. This is the magic of mathematicians, mechanical and electrical engineers, and computer scientists. So it was engineers who really created the, the world's tallest, fastest roller coaster. It was engineers who designed the airplane or the car that takes you and your family to the theme park when they open after this pandemic. It was engineers who came up with text messaging. 
who invented the smartphones or the solar plants. It was engineers who were the minds behind almost all of today's technologies. So engineers find ways to turn dreams into reality and to turn challenges into opportunities. I have to tell you a little bit about the pandemic and how that challenge actually created a whole new world of opportunities for us as educators to see how we can leverage technology and make sure we can reach to many students wherever they are so that we could share our knowledge base. There are many flavors of engineering to choose from. And I wanted to, I'll be sharing these slides with you all. And there are some links that to, uh, refer to our College of Engineering and University of Tennessee uh, that you could read more about them and read more about what our engineering volunteers are doing. But electrical, mechanical, civil, aerospace, biomedical, material engineering, chemical engineering, computer engineering and computer science, environmental engineering and the list keeps growing because you know what's happening we are finding each and every day how engineering can actually enhance a completely different field we are finding applications of engineering in medicine and it comes by medical engineering we are nowadays finding applications of engineering in finance there comes fintech and the data analytics and all other new branches so we are constantly finding new applications for engineering and the list keeps growing. Finally, before we end up, I want to make sure you are aware that Thursday, October 29th is our annual Engineers Day in UT and you are all invited. It will be a virtual event and we will be happy to host um, thanks to the virtual environment, not just Tennessee students, but we are going global this year. Again, thanks to technology, we're going to invite uh, whole world of students to come join us. So now the question I have is, do you want to lead the change or watch it happen? And the question I have for you, which we hopefully agreed on by now, is can you? So this was one girl's journey in engineering, and I'm hoping there'll be many journeys after this talk, and I'm happy to hear any questions you have and share with you any lessons I learned in my journey. Thank you very much. I am ready for questions. That was a really great talk. Yes, thank you very much. Um, I don't see any questions here. Um, uh, some positive feedback about how good it was. That's nice. And also some feedback about Eric's jokes. Um, yeah, so, yeah. While, the, while people type their questions, um, yes. You know, one of the things that I've, I've heard over and over again is that solar flares have been noted, and since you deal with antennas, that our modern civilization is at risk due to a large solar flare burning out our entire computer electrical satellite system. From your viewpoint, uh, do you have an opinion? I do have an opinion. <laughs> uh, it's part of my job to have opinion on everything, right? <laughs> uh, that is correct. Actually, solar flares, and they are rather periodic. Having worked in satellite industry myself, I'm familiar with the phenomenon. And it's something to be concerned about, especially for our satellite systems, as they may be subjected to them more than us on Earth, which the magnetic field of Earth kind of protects us. Uh, but certainly for our satellite systems, it's a major concern. Again, tendency is that every seven years is the periodicity of high activity of the coronal mass ejections. Uh, but um, uh, there may be anomalies. And uh, recently it's been in the news that our magnetic field has some distortion, which may make us susceptible to solar flares. That's uh, 
the the field magnetic field protects us somewhat better uh, than we on earth but again uh, the, any hardware that's subjected to it uh, on satellites uh, is a concern now it's not necessarily a devastating phenomenon uh, but we may have loss of data uh, and maybe loss of gps navigation for moments at a time because of that but it's something we have to be aware as we design our systems especially for um uh for for satellite systems that are uh, uh, not uh, protected by the magnetic field that's a really good question though so as engineers we need to be aware of not just the system we are designing but where it's operating and it's uh, that's what we call system specs as we design things we need to understand the operate the mode uh, environment they will be operating in and plan for that so you would want to have some margins in your system to make sure if that happens that my system will be able to allow that Um, anyway, one, one, one question to ask, um, why did you choose electrical engineering other, other, over other fields of engineering? Oh, I'm glad that question came. Uh, now, I'm the Associate Dean of Engineering, so I have, quote unquote, no preference over any engineering. <laughs> <laughs> But personally, <laughs> um, so growing up in Istanbul, Turkey, uh, I was, I mean, there was, it was a optimization problem, uh, how I decided. Uh, it was, okay, I have to admit this I can attitude I started taking way too seriously when I was in a, a high school. It was one of the hardest colleges to get into and hardest disciplines to get into. So I was kind of motivated definitely by that, that it was the top choice at the time. But uh, having been in the field, I really think for a girl, it's a wonderful opportunity of course for boys too but being a female i want to mention first of all i don't need to worry about broken fingernails because the devices are very small uh secondly um i think it enabled me to actually uh, have opportunities like uh, a career that would allow me to work from home because sometimes all I need would be a computer and an internet access. Uh, so it is a very flexible career opportunity what electrical engineering does. And nowadays, if you look at all the technology around us, and it will sound like bragging, and I'm going to brag, it's the electrical engineers who have really made a huge impact on the way we live. Actually, it transformed our lives from medicine to communication, every gadget we are surrounded with nowadays is a miracle of electrical engineers not to mention of course all other engineering have some many miracles that contribute to the way we live but the, it's portability i think flexibility and its future prospects uh, i am very happy that i chose electrical engineering okay as my career. so uh, i actually rose would you like i I opened it. Would you like to ask your own question? You want me to read your question? I'll ask it. Okay. So earlier when you said that it takes three satellites to pinpoint a person using GPS, mm -hmm. is that the same as that it takes three cities to pinpoint the location of an earth, the epicenter of an earthquake? Yes. Uh, the reason is actually uh, three circles is the explanation for that rose that if you know that relative to your position the distance of the object of interest it must lie on a circle right that's the definition of a circle it's a point locus of all points that are equidistant so if you know from me 100 meters away is someone i want to find that person should lie on a circle that you drove around me with a hundred mile radius now there are infinitely many points on that circle. So to pinpoint the same person, I need two more people who tells me it's 100 miles equidistant from me. So once you draw those circles, the intersection will be one point. So that's the magic of three that it comes from. It's pure geometry. That's the beauty of math. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Rose. So let me say, uh, 
Let me just say, as a mathematician, I'm a person who believes mathematics is behind all of this to start with, actually. I cannot disagree. <laughs> I have a mathematician father. <laughs> and so calculus is behind a lot of this. So, uh, so you can decide, you know, if you want to influence uh, future technology, you can do it with mathematics or follow it down the line with engineering. So it's a mixture. Absolutely. Right, right, Absolutely. Right, right, it's right, the right. universal language. Absolutely. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, um, we're, um, and so we're going to, you know, send out the links. Of course, these, uh, links to these videos are up on that will be up on the Nivis website, but also people who attend this will be getting a link, uh, in the emails about this. So you'll be able to see this later if someone else wants to see it. Um, were there any other questions that I, somebody, if, if you want to raise your hand, uh, I can even let you, if anybody wants to give a, anybody wants to talk, I can unmute them and they can ask directly or anything. Um, uh, anybody else? How about Emma? I don't know who Emma is, but Emma, do you want to ask anything? Oh, okay. Uh, okay. So, um, so thank you very much. We really enjoyed this talk and uh, we just really appreciate it. Thank you. So anyway. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thank you. We appreciate it. All right.